Latin spelling, or Latin orthography, is the spelling of Latin words written in the scripts of all historical phases of Latin from Old Latin to the present. All scripts use the same alphabet, but conventional spellings may vary from phase to phase. The Roman alphabet, or Latin alphabet, was adapted from the Old Italic script to represent the phonemes of the Latin language. The Old Italic script had in turn been borrowed from the Greek alphabet, itself adapted from the Phoenician alphabet. The Latin alphabet most resembles the Greek alphabet around 540 BC, as it appears on the black figure pottery of the time. Latin pronunciation continually evolved over the centuries, making it difficult for speakers in one era to know how Latin was spoken in prior eras. A given phoneme may be represented by different letters in different periods. This article deals primarily with modern scholarship's best reconstruction of classical Latin's phonemes phonology and the pronunciation and spelling used by educated people in the late Republic. This article then touches upon later changes and other variants. Letter forms The forms of the Latin alphabet used during the Classical period did not distinguish between upper case and lower case. Roman inscriptions typically use Roman square capitals, which resemble modern capitals, and handwritten text often uses Old Roman cursive, which includes letterforms similar to modern lowercase. This article uses small caps for Latin text, representing Roman square capitals, and long vowels are marked with acutes, representing apices. In the tables below, Latin letters and digraphs are paired with the phonemes they usually represent in the International Phonetic Alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> letters and phonemes In ancient Latin spelling, individual letters mostly corresponded to individual phonemes, with three main exceptions. The vowel letters a, e, i, o, u, y represented both short and long vowels. The long vowels were often marked by apices during the classical period a acute a o v, y with acute, and long i was written using a taller version i, called i longa, long i, but now long vowels are sometimes written with a macron in modern editions a, while short vowels are marked with a brief a in dictionaries when necessary. Some pairs of vowel letters, such as a, represented either a diphthong in one syllable or two vowels in adjacent syllables. The letters i and u, v represented either the close vowels, i, and, u, or the semivowels, j, and, with. In the tables below, Latin letters and digraphs are paired with the phonemes that they usually represent in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Consonants. <laughs> <laughs> This is a table of the consonant sounds of classical Latin. Sounds in parentheses are allophones, sounds with an asterisk exist mainly in loanwords and sounds with a dagger are phonemes only in some analyses. <laughs> Notes on phonetics The labialized velar stops, k, and, may both have been single phonemes rather than clusters like the, kw, and, with in English quick and penguin. K, is more likely to have been a phoneme than. K, occurs between vowels and counts as a single consonant in classical Latin poetry, but, occurs only after, where it cannot be identified as a single or double consonant. K, and, were palatalized before a front vowel, becoming, K, and, as in key, K, I, listen compared with quad, K, D, and lingua, L, A, compared with pinguis, P, S. This sound change did not apply to, with in the same position, ui v, y. K, before, U, may have become K, by dissimilation. This is suggested by the fact that equus, KS, and ungunt, ent Old Latin equos and unguent are spelled acus and ungunt, which may have indicated the pronunciations, Ks, and, ent. These spellings may, however, simply indicate that CG before U were labialized like, K, so that writing a WU was redundant. The voiceless plosives, p t k k, in Latin were likely less aspirated than voiceless plosives at the beginning of words in English, for example, Latin, k, was not as strongly aspirated as k in kind but more like k in English sky or look. However, there was no phonemic contrast between voiceless and aspirated plosives in native Latin words, and the voiceless plosives were probably somewhat aspirated at the beginnings of words and near, r, and, l. 
Some Greek words beginning with the voiceless plosives, ptk, when they were borrowed into colloquial Latin, were spelled with the graphemes used to represent voiced plosives bdg, bd, e.g., Latin gubernator besides West Greek kybernatus helmsman. That suggests that Latin speakers felt the Greek voiceless plosives to sound less aspirated than their own native equivalents. The aspirated consonants, ptk, as distinctive phonemes were originally foreign to Latin, appearing in educated loanwords and names from Greek. In such cases, the aspiration was likely produced only by educated speakers. Z, was also not native to classical Latin. It appeared in Greek loanwords starting around the 1st century BC, when it was probably pronounced z initially and doubled z -z between vowels, in contrast to classical Greek dz or zd. In classical Latin poetry, the letter Z between vowels always counts as two consonants for metrical purposes. In classical Latin, the coronal sibilant, S, was likely unvoiced in all positions. In Old Latin, single, S, between vowels was pronounced as voiced, Z, but had changed to, R, by rhoticism by the time of classical Latin, as in gero slash e dot rho, as compared with gestus slash s dot tus. Intervocalic s in classical usually derives from an earlier double ss after a long vowel or diphthong, as in casa, casus from earlier casa, casus, or from loanwords such as pausa from Greek pausis, pausis. In Old Latin, final s after a short vowel was often lost, probably after first changing to h debuccalization, as in the inscriptional form Cornelio for Cornelios, classical Latin Cornelius. Often in the poetry of Plautus, Ennius, and Lucretius, final s, before a word beginning in a consonant did not make the preceding syllable heavy. f, was labiodental in classical Latin, but it may have been bilabial, in Old Latin, or perhaps, in free variation with f. Lloyd, Sturtevant, and Kent make this argument based on certain misspellings in inscriptions, the Proto-Indo-European phone asterisk B from which many instances of the Latin F descended others are from asterisk D and asterisk G and the way the sound appears to have behaved in Vulgar Latin, particularly in Spain. In most cases per meter, was pronounced as a bilabial nasal. At the end of a word, however, it was generally lost beginning in Old Latin except when another nasal or a plosive followed it, causing the preceding vowel to be lengthened and nasalized, as in decem d, k, listen. In Old Latin inscriptions, it is often omitted, as in viro for viram, classical viram. It was frequently alighted before a following vowel in Latin poetry, and it was lost without a trace apart from the lengthening in the Romance languages, except in monosyllabic words. N, assimilated to per meter, before labial consonants as in impar m dot par listen, assimilated to a velar nasal, before n. Allen and Greeno say that a vowel before n is always long, but W. Sidney Allen says that is based on an interpolation in Prishon, and the vowel was actually long or short depending on the root, as for example regnum re, n, from the root of rex re case, but magnus ma, ns, from the root of magus ma, s, probably did not assimilate to before per meter. The cluster, m, arose by syncope, as for example tegmen, t, mn, from tegemen. Original, m, developed into per millimeter, in flamma, from the root of flagro. At the start of a word, n, was reduced to, n, and this change was reflected in the orthography in later texts, natus, na, tees, became natus, nosco, no dotsco, became nosco. In classical Latin, the rhotic, r, was most likely an alveolar trill, r. Gaius Lucilius likens it to the sound of a dog, and later writers describe it as being produced by vibration. In Old Latin, intervocalic, z, developed into, r, rhoticism, suggesting an approximant like the English, and, d, was sometimes written as, r, suggesting a tap, like Spanish single r. l, had two allophones in Latin, l, and, Roman grammarians called these variants axillus, thin, and plenus or pinguis, full, or, thick. Those adjectives are used elsewhere for front and back vowels respectively, which suggests that the thin allophone was a plain alveolar lateral approximant l, like the clear l, in English leaf in some English dialects or that of languages like Spanish or German, while the full or thick allophone was velarized like the English dark l, in full. It is partly uncertain where these allophones occurred. Zeeler and Allen agree that l was clear when the sound was doubled as ll and dark when it occurred before another consonant or at the end of a word, but disagree on whether clear or dark l occurred before vowels. 
Zeiler says that l was clear before i and dark before other vowels, but Allen says that l was dark before back vowels in pre classical Latin and clear before both front and back vowels in classical Latin. This represents a partial agreement, however, in that Zeiler argues the classical Latin l had three degrees of velarization, with a darker enunciation before consonants than vowels. J generally appeared only at the beginning of words, before a vowel, as in iasio, ya, k, o, except in compound words such as adiasio, ad ya, k, o, listen. Between vowels, this sound was generally not found as a single consonant, only as doubled, j, as in quius slash cuj dot ju, listen, except in compound words such as traectus slash tra jek dot tus, j, varied with, i, in the same morpheme in i am, j a tilde, and etiam slash e dot t, a tilde, and in poetry, one could be replaced with the other for the purposes of meter. With was pronounced as an approximant until the first century AD, when, with and, b, began to develop into fricatives. In poetry, with and u could be replaced with each other, as in slash c dot lu, a, for silva slash, dot wa, and slash n dot wa, for genua slash e dot nu, a. Unlike j, it was not doubled as w, or ww, between vowels, except in Greek loanwords, k slash ka dot we, but a vander slash u one dot der, from euandros. Notes on spelling Doubled consonant letters, such as cc, ss, represented geminated doubled or long consonants, ks. In Old Latin, geminate consonants were written singly like single consonants, until the middle of the 2nd century BC, when they began to be doubled in writing. Grammarians mention the marking of double consonants with the sicilicus, a diacritic in the shape of a sickle. This mark appears in a few inscriptions of the Augustan era. C and K both represent the velar stop, K, Q represents the labialized velar stop, K. The letters Q and C distinguish minimal pairs between Q and K, such as qui, qui, and ki, ki. In classical Latin, K appeared in only a few words, such as calendae. X represented the consonant cluster per kilosecond. In Old Latin, this sequence was also spelled as Ks, Cs, and Xs. X was borrowed from the Western Greek alphabet, in which the letter form of chi chi was pronounced as per kilosecond. In the standard Ionic alphabet, used for modern editions of ancient Greek, on the other hand, chi represented k, and the letter shi shi represented per kilosecond. In Old Latin inscriptions, k and were not distinguished. They were both represented by c before e and i, q before o and u, and k before consonants and a. The letter form of C derives from Greek gamma gamma, which represented, but its use for K may come from Etruscan, which did not distinguish voiced and voiceless plosives. In classical Latin, C represented only in C and CN, the abbreviations of the prenomena first names Gaius and Gnaeus. The letter G was created in the 3rd century BC to distinguish the voiced from voiceless K. Its letter form derived from C by the addition of a diacritic or stroke. Plutarch attributes this innovation to Spurius Carvilius Ruga around 230 BC, but it may have originated with Appius Claudius Caicus in the 4th century BC. The combination gn probably represented the consonant cluster n, at least between vowels, as in onus a, ns listen, vowels before this cluster were sometimes long and sometimes short. The digraphs ph, th, and ch represented the aspirated plosives p, t, and k. They began to be used in writing around 150 BC, primarily as a transcription of Greek phi phi, theta theta, and chi chi, as in Philippus, Scythara, and Achaia. Some native words were later also written with these digraphs, such as pulcher, lacrima, gracchus, triumphus, probably representing aspirated allophones of the voiceless plosives near r, and l. Aspirated plosives and the glottal fricative, h, were also used hypercorrectively, an affectation satirized in Catullus 84. In Old Latin, coin Greek initial, z, and, zz, between vowels were represented by s and ss, as in sona from zone and massa from maza. Around the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, the Greek letter zeta zeta was adopted to represent, z, and, zz. However, the vulgar Latin spellings z or z for earlier d and d before e, and the spellings d and dz for earlier z, suggest the pronunciation, dz, as for example zeometis for diometis, and dieta for zeta. 
In ancient times U and I represented the approximant consonants, with and, j, as well as the close vowels, u, and, i. I representing the consonant, j, was usually not doubled in writing so a single I represented double, j, or, j j, and the sequences, g, and, j i, as in quius for asterisk quius slash kuj dot ju, kniset for asterisk konikit slash con dot g dot kit, and riket for asterisk rayasit slash reg dot g dot kit. Both the consonantal and vocalic pronunciations of I could occur in some of the same environments. Compare Mayas slash Maj. Ju, with Gaius slash A. I. Us, and Ulius slash Ju. Li. Us, with Ulus slash I. U. Lus. The vowel before a doubled, J, is sometimes marked with a macron, as in quius. It indicates not that the vowel is long but that the first syllable is heavy from the double consonant. V between vowels represented single, with in native Latin words but double, ww, in Greek loanwords. Both the consonantal and vocalic pronunciations of V sometimes occurred in similar environments, as in genua, n, a, and silva, sl, wa. Vowels Monophthongs Latin has ten native vowels, spelled a, e, i, o, u. In classical Latin, each vowel had short and long versions, a, and a, e, i, o, u. The long versions of the close and mid vowels e, i, o, u had a different vowel quality from the short versions, so that long, e, o, were similar to short. Some loanwords from Greek had the vowel y, which was pronounced as y y by educated speakers but approximated with the native vowels u and i by less educated speakers. Topic: <laughs> Long and short vowels. Each vowel letter with the possible exception of y represents at least two phonemes. A can represent either short a or long. A e represents either e or e, etc. Short mid vowels, eo, and close vowels, i u, were pronounced with a different quality from their long counterparts, being also more open. And this opening made the short vowels i u similar in quality to long a o, e o, respectively. i a and u o were often written in place of each other in inscriptions. Trebibos for tribibus, ter, b, b's. Minzis for mensis, m, ss. Sob for sub, sb. Punir for paner, po, ne, r, short, e, most likely had a more open allophone before, r, and tended toward near open, a, short, e, and, i, were probably pronounced closer when they occurred before another vowel, mea was written as mia in inscriptions. Short, i, before another vowel is often written with i longa, as in dies, indicating that its quality was similar to that of long, i, and is almost never confused with e in this position. Adoption of Greek upsilon Y was used in Greek loanwords with upsilon upsilon, this letter represented the close front rounded vowel, both short and long, y y. Latin did not have this sound as a distinctive phoneme, and speakers tended to pronounce such loanwords with u u in Old Latin and i i in Classical and Late Latin if they were unable to produce y y. Topic. Sonus medius An intermediate vowel sound likely a close central vowel, or possibly its rounded counterpart, called sonus medius, can be reconstructed for the classical period. Such a vowel is found in documentum, optimus, lacrima also spelled docimentum, optimus, lacruma and other words. It developed out of a historical short, u, later fronted by vowel reduction. In the vicinity of labial consonants, this sound was not as fronted and may have retained some rounding. Topic: <inaudible> Vowel nasalization. Vowels followed by a nasal consonant were allophonically realized as long nasal vowels in two environments. Before word final m, monstrum, mon dot strum slash greater than m o tilde dot str. Dentum slash den dot tem, greater than dn, t. Before nasal consonants followed by a fricative, sensor slash ken dot sor, greater than k, sir, in early inscriptions, often written as sessor. 
Consul slash con dot sul, greater than ko tilde, sl, often written as cosol and abbreviated as cuz. Inferos slash in dot fe dot ro s, greater than, f ash dot ros, written as iferous, those long nasal vowels had the same quality as ordinary long vowels. In vulgar Latin, the vowels lost their nasalization, and they merged with the long vowels, which were themselves shortened by that time. This is shown by many forms in the Romance languages, such as Spanish costar from Vulgar Latin costare originally constare and Italian mis from Vulgar Latin mis classical Latin mensum. On the other hand, the short vowel and n was restored in French enseigne and enfant from insignia and infantum e is the normal development of Latin short i, likely by analogy with other forms beginning in the prefix in, when a final m occurred before a plosive or nasal in the next word, however, it was pronounced as a nasal at the place of articulation of the following consonant. For instance, tan durum tan du, r, was written for tam durum in inscriptions, and cum nobis k no, by s, was a double entendre, possibly for cuno bis no bis. Topic: <laughs> Diphthongs. A o o a e u could represent diphthongs. A represented a, o represented o, o represented o, a represented a. And eu represented eu, ui sometimes represented the diphthong ui, as in qui listen and huic. If there is a trema above the second vowel, both vowels are pronounced separately a, a, o, a, u, and o. In Old Latin, a, o were written as i, oi, and probably pronounced as i, oi, with a fully closed second element, similar to the final syllable in French travail. In the late Old Latin period, the last element of the diphthongs was lowered to e, so that the diphthongs were pronounced a and o in classical Latin, similar to the diphthongs in English high and boy. They were then monophthongized to and e, starting in rural areas at the end of the Republican period. The process, however, does not seem to have been completed before the 3rd century AD in Vulgar Latin, and some scholars say that it may have been regular by the 5th century. Topic. Vowel and consonant length Vowel and consonant length were more significant and more clearly defined in Latin than in modern English. Length is the duration of time that a particular sound is held before proceeding to the next sound in a word. Unfortunately, vowel length is a confusing term for English speakers, who, in their language, call long vowels what are usually diphthongs rather than monophthongs. That is a relic of the great vowel shift, during which vowels that had once been pronounced phonemically longer turned into diphthongs. In the modern spelling of Latin, especially in dictionaries and academic work, macrons are frequently used to mark long vowels, e i o u, while the breve is sometimes used to indicate that a vowel is short, e i o u y. Long consonants were usually indicated through doubling, but ancient Latin orthography did not distinguish between the vocalic and consonantal uses of i and v. Vowel length was indicated only intermittently in classical sources and even then through a variety of means. Later medieval and modern usage tended to omit vowel length altogether. A short-lived convention of spelling long vowels by doubling the vowel letter is associated with the poet Lucius Accius. Later spelling conventions marked long vowels with an apex a diacritic similar to an acute accent or, in the case of long i, by increasing the height of the letter long i. In the 2nd century AD, those were given apices as well. Distinctions of vowel length had become less important in later Latin and have ceased to be phonemic in the modern Romance languages, in which the previous long and short versions of the vowels have been either lost or replaced by other phonetic contrasts. A minimal set showing both long and short vowels and long and short consonants is anus slash a dot news, buttocks, anus slash and dot news, year, anus slash a dot news, old woman. Topic: <laughs> Table of orthography. Topic: <laughs> 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 Syllables and stress. Topic: Old Latin stress. In Old Latin, as in Proto-Italic, stress normally fell on the first syllable of a word. 
During this period, the word initial stress triggered changes in the vowels of non initial syllables, the effects of which are still visible in classical Latin. Compare, for example, facio, I do, make, factus, made, pronounced slash fa dot ki, o, and slash fact dot tus, in later Old Latin and classical Latin. Officio, I affect, affectus, affected, pronounced slash af dot phi dot ki, o, and slash af dot fec dot tus, in Old Latin following vowel reduction, slash af dot phi dot ki, o, and slash af dot fec dot tus, in classical Latin, in the earliest Latin writings, the original unreduced vowels are still visible. Study of this vowel reduction, as well as syncopation dropping of short unaccented syllables in Greek loan words, indicates that the stress remained word initial until around the time of Plautus, the 3rd century BC. The placement of the stress then shifted to become the pattern found in classical Latin. <laughs> classical Latin syllables and stress In classical Latin, stress changed. It moved from the first syllable to one of the last three syllables, called the antipenult, the penult, and the ultima short for antipenultima before almost last, penultima almost last, and ultima syllaba last syllable. Its position is determined by the syllable weight of the penult. If the penult is heavy, it is accented, if the penult is light and there are more than two syllables, the antipenult is accented. In a few words originally accented on the penult, accent is on the ultima because the two last syllables have been contracted, or the last syllable has been lost. Syllable To determine stress, syllable weight of the penult must be determined. To determine syllable weight, words must be broken up into syllables. In the following examples, syllable structure is represented using these symbols, C a consonant, K a stop, R a liquid, and V a short vowel, V V a long vowel or diphthong. Nucleus Every short vowel, long vowel, or diphthong belongs to a single syllable. This vowel forms the syllable nucleus. Thus magisterum has four syllables, one for every vowel a -I -A -U, v -V 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 -V. Arius has three a -E -U, v -V -V -V. Tuo has two U -O, v -V -V. and Qui has one Ui, v -V. Topic. Onset and coda A consonant before a vowel, or a consonant cluster at the beginning of a word, is placed in the same syllable as the following vowel. This consonant or consonant cluster forms the syllable onset. Femine slash fe dot me dot ne. CVV, CV, CVV. Vidir slash y dot de dot re. CV, CVV, CV. Puero slash pu dot e dot ro. CV, V, CVV. Bite slash b dot a dot tie. CV, VV, CVV. Graviter slash ra dot y dot tear, ccv, cv, cvc. Stratum slash straw dot tum, cccvv, cvc. After this, if there is an additional consonant inside the word, it is placed at the end of the syllable. This consonant is the syllable coda. Thus, if a consonant cluster of two consonants occurs between vowels, they are broken up between syllables, one goes with the syllable before, the other with the syllable after. Puella, pu dot l dot la slash cv, vc, cv. Supersum, su dot per dot sum slash cv, cvc, cvc. Coactus slash co dot ak dot tus, cv, vvc, cvc. Intellexit slash in dot tel dot la k dot sit, vc, cvc, cvvc, cvc. There are two exceptions. A consonant cluster of a stop ptcbdg followed by a liquid lr between vowels usually goes to the syllable after it, although it is also sometimes broken up like other consonant clusters. Volucris, wo dot lu dot chris slash or wo dot luck dot ris slash cv, cv, krvc or cv, cvk. rvc. Topic: Heavy and light syllables. As shown in the examples above, Latin syllables have a variety of possible structures. Here are some of them. 
The first four examples are light syllables, and the last six are heavy. All syllables have at least one V vowel. A syllable is heavy if it has another V or a VC after the first V in the table below, the extra V or VC is bolded, indicating that it makes the syllable heavy. Thus, a syllable is heavy if it ends in a long vowel or diphthong, a short vowel and a consonant, a long vowel and a consonant, or a diphthong and a consonant. Syllables ending in a diphthong and consonant are rare in classical Latin. The syllable onset has no relationship to syllable weight, both heavy and light syllables can have no onset or an onset of one, two, or three consonants. In Latin a syllable that is heavy because it ends in a long vowel or diphthong is traditionally called syllaba natura longa syllable long by nature, and a syllable that is heavy because it ends in a consonant is called position longa long by position. These terms are translations of Greek syllabi makrophysae syllabi makrophysae. Topic: Syllable long by nature and makrotae makrotae. Long by proposition, respectively. Therefore, position should not be mistaken for implying a syllable is long because of its position place in a word, but rather is treated as long by convention. This article uses the words heavy and light for syllables, and long and short for vowels since the two are not the same. Topic. Stress rule In a word of three or more syllables, the weight of the penult determines where the accent is placed. If the penult is light, accent is placed on the antipenult, if it is heavy, accent is placed on the penult. Below, stress is marked by placing the stress mark before the stressed syllable. Topic. Iambic shortening Iambic shortening or brevis brevians is vowel shortening that occurs in words of the type light heavy, where the light syllable is stressed. By this sound change, words like ego, modo, bene, ama with long final vowel change to ego, modo, bene, ama with short final vowel. Elision <inaudible> 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 Where one word ended with a vowel including a nasalized vowel, represented by a vowel plus m and the next word began with a vowel, the former vowel, at least in verse, was regularly elided, that is, it was omitted altogether, or possibly in the case of i, and, u, pronounced like the corresponding semivowel. When the second word was est or et, a different form of elision sometimes occurred protolision, the vowel of the preceding word was retained, and the e was elided instead. Elision also occurred in ancient Greek, but in that language, it is shown in writing by the vowel in question being replaced by an apostrophe, whereas in Latin elision is not indicated at all in the orthography, but can be deduced from the verse form. Only occasionally is it found in inscriptions, as in scriptist for scriptum est. <laughs> Latin spelling and pronunciation today Topic. Spelling Modern usage, even for classical Latin texts, varies in respect of I and V during the Renaissance. The printing convention was to use I uppercase and I lowercase for both vocalic, I, and consonantal, J, to use V in the uppercase and in the lowercase to use V at the start of words and U subsequently within the word regardless of whether U, and, with was represented. Many publishers such as Oxford University Press have adopted the convention of using I uppercase and I lowercase for both, I, and, J, and V uppercase case and u lower case for both u and with an alternative approach less common today is to use i and u only for the vowels and j and v for the approximants most modern editions however adopt an intermediate position distinguishing between u and v but not between i and j usually the non-vocalic v after q or g is still printed as u rather than v probably because in this position it did not change from with to v in post classical times textbooks and dictionaries indicate the length of vowels by putting a macron or horizontal bar above the long vowel but it is not generally done in regular texts 
Occasionally, mainly in early printed texts up to the 18th century, one may see a circumflex used to indicate a long vowel where this makes a difference to the sense, for instance, Roma, R O ma, from Rome ablative compared to Roma, R O ma, Rome nominative. Sometimes, for instance in Roman Catholic service books, an acute accent over a vowel is used to indicate the stressed syllable. It would be redundant for one who knew the classical rules of accentuation and made the correct distinction between long and short vowels, but most Latin speakers since the 3rd century have not made any distinction between long and short vowels, but they have kept the accents in the same places, thus, the use of accent marks allows speakers to read a word aloud correctly even if they never heard it spoken aloud. Pronunciation. <inaudible> 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 Post-medieval Latin Since around the beginning of the Renaissance period onwards, with the language being used as an international language among intellectuals, pronunciation of Latin in Europe came to be dominated by the phonology of local languages, resulting in a variety of different pronunciation systems. <laughs> Loan words and formal study When Latin words are used as loanwords in a modern language, there is ordinarily little or no attempt to pronounce them as the Romans did. In most cases, a pronunciation suiting the phonology of the receiving language is employed. Latin words in common use in English are generally fully assimilated into the English sound system, with little to mark them as foreign, for example, cranium, saliva. Other words have a stronger Latin feel to them, usually because of spelling features such as the digraphs a and o occasionally written as ligatures, a and o, respectively, which both denote, i, in English. The digraph a or ligature a in some words tend to be given an, a, pronunciation, for example, curriculum vitae. However, using loan words in the context of the language borrowing them is a markedly different situation from the study of Latin itself. In this classroom setting, instructors and students attempt to recreate at least some sense of the original pronunciation. What is taught to native Anglophones is suggested by the sounds of today's Romance languages, the direct descendants of Latin. Instructors who take this approach rationalize that Romance vowels probably come closer to the original pronunciation than those of any other modern language see also the section below on derivative languages. However, other languages, including Romance family members—all have their own interpretations of the Latin phonological system, applied both to loan words and formal study of Latin. But English, Romance, or other teachers do not always point out that the particular accent their students learn is not actually the way ancient Romans spoke. <laughs> Ecclesiastical pronunciation Because of the central position of Rome within the Catholic Church, an Italian pronunciation of Latin became commonly accepted, but this was not the case until the latter part of the 19th century. This pronunciation corresponds to that of the Latin-derived words in Italian. Before then, the pronunciation of Latin in church was the same as the pronunciation as Latin in other fields and tended to reflect the sound values associated with the nationality of the speaker. The following are the main points that distinguish modern ecclesiastical pronunciation from classical Latin pronunciation. Vowel length is not phonemic. As a result, the automatic stress accent of classical Latin, which was dependent on vowel length, becomes a phonemic one in ecclesiastical Latin. Some ecclesiastical texts mark the stress with an acute accent in words of three or more syllables. The digraphs a and o, sometimes written as ligatures a and o, represent c denotes t, as in English ch, before a, a, o, o, e, i or y. g denotes d as in English J before A, A, O, O, E, I or Y. H is silent except in two words, Mihi and Nile, where it represents K. In the Middle Ages, these words were spelled Michi and Nichiel. S between vowels represents Z, or S. SC before A, A, O, O, E, I or Y, represents T, if followed by a vowel, not word initial or stressed, and not preceded by S, T, or X represents T, C. The letter V when it starts a syllable is pronounced V, and not with as in classical Latin. 
between G or Q and a vowel, it retains the ancient with pronunciation, and as a syllable nucleus, it retains U. Unlike in the ancient orthography, the letter V is now written V when it is pronounced V, but U when it is pronounced with or U. TH represents T. PH represents F. CH represents K. Y represents I. GN represents X represents per kilo second, the S, of which merges with a following C that precedes A, A, O, O, E, I or Y to form as in excelsis, excelsis. Z represents DZ. Word final M and N are pronounced fully, with no nasalization of the preceding vowel. In his Vox Latina, a guide to the pronunciation of classical Latin, William Sidney Allen remarked that this pronunciation, used by the Catholic Church in Rome and elsewhere, and whose adoption Pope Pius X recommended in a 1912 letter to the Archbishop of Borges, is probably less far removed from classical Latin than any other national pronunciation. But, as can be seen from the table above, there are, nevertheless, very significant differences. The introduction to the Liber Usualis indicates that ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation should be used at church liturgies. Ecclesiastical pronunciation is also the preferred pronunciation of Catholics whenever speaking Latin even if not as part of liturgy. The Pontifical Academy for Latin is the Pontifical Academy in the Vatican that is charged with the dissemination and education of Catholics in the Latin language. Outside of Austria and Germany, it is the most widely used standard in choral singing which, with a few exceptions like Stravinsky's Oedipus Rex, is concerned with liturgical texts. Anglican choirs adopted it when classicists abandoned traditional English pronunciation after World War II. The rise of historically informed performance and the availability of guides such as Copeman's singing in Latin has led to the recent revival of regional pronunciations. Topic. Pronunciation shared by Vulgar Latin and Romance languages Because it gave rise to many modern languages, Latin did not strictly «die». It merely evolved over the centuries in diverse ways. The local dialects of Vulgar Latin that emerged eventually became modern Italian, Spanish, French, Romanian, Portuguese, Catalan, Romanche, Dalmatian, Sardinian, and many others. Key features of Vulgar Latin and Romance languages include Almost total loss of H, and final unstressed per meter. Conversion of the distinction of vowel length into a distinction of height, and subsequent merger of some of these phonemes. Most Romance languages merged short U, with long O, and short I, with long E. Monophthongization of A, into, and O, into, E. Loss of marginal phonemes such as aspirates, p, t, and, k, which became tenues, and the close front rounded vowel, y, which became unrounded. Loss of, n, before, s, cl sponsa greater than vl sposa, but this influence on the later development of Romance languages was limited from written influence, analogy, and learned borrowings. Palatalization of, k, before, e, and, i, not in all varieties, probably first into, k, and then, t, before it finally developed into, ts, or, t. Palatalization of, before, e, and, i, and of, j, into, d, not in all varieties, and then further into, in some romance varieties. Palatalization of, t, followed by a vowel, if not preceded by s, t, x, into, tsj. It merged with ts in dialects in which k had developed into this sound, but it remained separate elsewhere, such as Italian. Palatalization of li and ni followed by a vowel into and n orthographic gn also coalesced to become the change of with except after k and b between vowels into beta. Topic examples. <laughs> <laughs> The following examples are both in verse, which demonstrates several features more clearly than prose. Topic from Classical Latin. Virgil's Aeneid, Book One, Verses One to Four. Quantitative meter, dactylic hexameter. Translation. 
I sing of arms and the man, who, driven by fate, came first from the borders of Troy to Italy and the Lavinian shores, he was much afflicted both on lands and on the deep by the power of the gods, because of fierce Juno's vindictive wrath. Ancient Roman orthography before second century Arma VIR VM QVE Cano Troia QVPR MVS Abor S TALIAM FATO PROF VGVS LAB NIA QVE VENIT L TORA MVL TVM IL ETTERRS IACTATIVES ETALTO VSVPERVM SAEVAEMEMORIM IV NONIS OB RAM Traditional 19th century English orthography Arma virumqua cano, troje qui primus ab oris Italium, fato profugis, Laviniac venit Litera, multum il et terris jictatis et alto V superum, savi memorum junonis ob aram. Modern orthography with macrons Arma virumqua cano, troje qui primus ab oris Italium, fato profugis, Laviniac venit Litera, multum il et terris i actatis et alto V superum, savi memorum iunonis ob aram. Modern orthography without macrons Arma virum clicano, troia qui primus ab oris Italium, fato profugis, Laviniac venit Litera, multum il et terris i actatis et alto V superum, savi memorum iunonis ob aram. Reconstructed classical Roman pronunciation Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than r dot ma w r k ka no tro j k i p r i m za b o re s less than pre greater than slash pre greater than i dot ta dot li a tilde f a to p r f s la y dot nya k we and less than pre greater than slash pre greater than li dot t dot ra m t l l t tur re s jack ta t s t a two Y S pay R S W A E M M R J U no N S B I R A tilde. Note the elisions in mult um and il e in the third line. For a fuller discussion of the prosodic features of this passage, see dactylic hexameter. Some manuscripts have Lavina rather than Lavinia in the second line. Topic from medieval Latin. Beginning of Pang Lingua Gloriosi Corporis Mysterium by Thomas Aquinas, 13th century. Rhymed accentual meter. Translation. Extol, my tongue, the mystery of the glorious body and the precious blood, which the fruit of a noble womb, the king of nations, poured out as the price of the world. 1. Traditional orthography as in Roman Catholic service books stressed syllable marked with an acute accent on words of three syllables or more. Pang lingua gloriosi Corporis mysterium Sanguinisque preciosi Quem in mundi pratium Fructus ventris generosi Rex effudit gentium.2 Italianate Ecclesiastical pronunciation Pan liwa lori oz Corporis mis t rium Sawi nisque pritsi oz Kwem in mundi piartium Fructus vientris dean roz Arches ef fu dit dentium See also Latin alphabet Latin grammar Latin regional pronunciation Traditional English pronunciation of Latin Deutsche Aussprache des Lateinischen in German traditional German pronunciation Schulaussprache des Lateinischen in German revised school pronunciation Französisch Aussprache des Latins in German traditional French pronunciation equals equals notes <laughs>